And today, we're exploring power. There is a lot of talk about power, but we don't often have a clear conceptual understanding of how it works. But we must understand it before we can harness it and use that to get the change that we want in our communities. Before we get stuck into this content, um, and as I'm introducing our speakers, I want you to take another poll. So um, we want to know how powerful you think you personally are. So rate yourself out of 10. How powerful do you think you personally are? Just thinking of you as an individual. So I'm pumped for the topic today, but also the trainers that we have discussing it, I'm really, really excited for you to hear from them. Many of you will now be familiar with Amanda Tattersall, who is a community organizer and researcher on social change. So she could co-found GetUp, she founded the Sydney Alliance and really loves organizing. Um, she also hosts Changemakers podcast, which covers stories of social change and, um, and that podcast is hosting this training series. And if you haven't already subscribed to it, please make sure you do. They're fantastic stories about people all over the world that are trying to get change and the inside stories about um, how they've gone about that. And it's a very, very special treat for us in Australia to have Eric Peterson calling all the way from his farm outside Duluth, Minnesota. Um, so Eric Peterson brings nearly 35 years of experience as a community union and electoral organiser to our session today. He's an expert trainer and practitioner with extensive experience working with unions and advocacy organisations, both in the US and the last 13 years working with many groups in Australia to Thank you, Beth. And just before I begin, I I just want to say I too am extremely excited that we've got Eric Peterson here all the way from Duluth, Minnesota. He's one of the uh, best trainers I have ever had the privilege to work with. I've worked with him for a long, long time. I've known him for over 15 years, and uh, you're all gonna just you know have a lot of fun with him. So blessed that he's here. It's like almost the middle of the night in Duluth. So this That's is- that bar. Hi, Amanda. <laughs> I, know. I just want to set expectations super high <laughs> because I know you'll jump over them. So now to the content. So I want to, we got, we're de dealing with the question of power and the first, the, the best way to come into that conversation is to think about how we feel about that term and then to explore what as a community organizer we mean by what, when we look at the question of power so we can sort of break it down so we can work out how we can harness it for good so you all um some of you i'm looking at the poll a bunch of you actually 74 out of 82 uh, uh either looked at the poll <laughs> or uh, answered the poll and um, this you know we all have different opinions when i say the word power you know, how does it make you actually feel? Do you feel scared or do you feel excited at the idea of power? You know, I, I imagine for many of you, the, the feeling is diverse and indeed the poll would suggest so. Some of you uh, think of certain behaviors and attributes in your head, certain people in your head, you know, who thinks of Stalin and other dictators when they think of the concept of power. For others of you who thinks, me, I'm powerful, I can be powerful. It's varied. So actually we can do a little bit of uh, sort of conversation with the gang here today and I, I, I will see how this plays out. But so you all raised your hands earlier. We didn't really raise your hands, you filled in a poll and I can see that there's a range of people. Some people saying that actually when you think of your own sense of power, you don't think of yourself as very powerful, twos or threes for others. Um, um, many of you think of yourself as more, some of you think of yourself as more powerful, seven and eights. So let's have a chat with some people who thought of themselves as less powerful. Who put down that they thought that they didn't feel powerful? Put up your hand. Okay, Yolanda, would you be interested in saying why you thought that? Uh, sure, Amanda. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, mainly because, and I was thinking more of public power. So the ability to influence uh, the policies and the laws that affect everyone. Um, the only power that I feel is maybe having a voice where I can write letters to uh, political people, people in authority, uh, or voting. And to me, that's not a lot of power. Yeah, yeah. 
And so it's fair enough. When we see power as an individualized thing, where a, a person in the middle of a pandemic, in particular, where we're completely isolated in our homes, it is hard to feel powerful. And, um, and that can be an incredible challenge. Who, who was bolder? Who, who thought that actually they did feel powerful? Who put themselves at like a seven or an eight? And wants to put up their hand. Mallory, would you be up for saying what you, why you did that? Yeah, sure. Um, well, I just feel like I've got access to so many resources and communities, um, well connected to a lot of people who are in the change making space. So, yeah. Um, yeah. So thank you. Thank you. So, so in some ways, our connection to others, our relationships, our sense of sort of being able to call on other resources can shift our understanding of, of power. And so let's go through, I want to go through and um, first I actually want to tell you a story about my own sense of understanding power. And then I want to break down the concept a little for us to, to maybe uh, I sort of respect and identify all the different forms of power um, the continuum of power that we experienced. So I too have had a very varied understanding of power. And I want to take you back to last century when I was deeply involved in the student movement um, and uh, where I had these sort of mixed understandings of power. So in 1999, I, had, I was um, very lucky and privileged to be elected the president of the National Union of Students. And it felt like a, it was a truly an honour um, to be able to hold such a role. And about five days before I became president of the National Union of Students, the education minister introduced this thing called voluntary student unionism, which was basically designed to destroy student organisations. Um, and, and also in particular to destroy the ability for students to advocate. And <laughs> it was kind of terrifying because I was like, I'm going to be the last president of the National Union of Students. Like this whole thing has been killed before. I even started. I felt truly powerless, like Yolanda, this sense that I, you know, what tools do we have, you know, me as an individual or even us as a movement to turn something so complex and difficult around? You know, I really didn't feel like I had the resources I needed. But then um, relatively soon, over, you know, quickly over time, to be honest, we started building quite a large group of people who were prepared to work in a campaign together. We wouldn't be surprised in a way similar to what Mallory described, it wasn't just people coming together as people, but it was actually the resources and skills that they brought to the question of the campaign that was what was most important, doing power analysis and deep strategy and identifying who were the key targets for a decision like this. When I felt powerless, I, you know, it was this feeling of domination, of, of secrecy that someone else was going to decide the future of students. But when I was... Um, helping to drive this big collective campaign. It felt creative. It felt like learning. It felt powerful. And one of the things that I remember from that campaign that was particularly powerful was that there was this guy who was the senator. Some of you will remember him and some of you will not. Um, um, will not. But a guy called Brian Carradine was in the Senate. And he was a senator from Tasmania and he was a very um, proud Catholic. And he had the balance of power. Him and another guy had the balance of power. And we started to go, right, we can have all the rallies in the street that we want, but if we can't convince him that he has to be on our side, we're, we're in the dust. And so we, but we started to, and we started building relationships with different churches. And eventually we built a relationship with the Cardinal, Cardinal Clancy. And Cardinal Clancy met with Brian Harradine and convinced Brian Harradine to help block the legislation in the Senate. And he blocked voluntary student unionism. And even though we had we felt like we had no power. With a student movement under the John Howard government, it really wasn't a time for relishing student power. We actually won. And it was this difference between the shift of feeling um, lacking power to being able to calculate and build a different sense of power. So for me, power can be bad and it can also be good. I've experienced, we all have experienced both. But often we're unsure about what power really means because of these dual associations, the negative and the positive. So we want to, um, you know, and the negative and the positive associations. And often, you know, in common society, I reckon if you polled most people, not just beautiful activists like you guys, most people would have a negative connotation around power. They would see power as secretive. They'd see power as dominating and tyrannical. And it's something that they don't want to be associated with. Certainly in my organising 
at the Sydney Alliance, that was the common frame that people came to this question. And one of our challenges as leaders and advocate, um, act, activists and advocates and change makers is to challenge this question about whether it's useful to be powerful. Because as, um, I think I've got a slide coming up. Um, as this slide describes, when you look up the word power in the dictionary, it doesn't say power is evil. It doesn't say power is uh, dictatorship. It just says power is the ability to act. And when we are confronted with the fact that there is a lot of things that need changing in our society, um, having the ability to act, having power to be powerful, acting for the common good is incredibly important. But the actual word power is very, very neutral. You know, Martin Luther King used to describe that, you know, power is neutral. It merely, it's merely the ability to achieve a purpose. And the question is, what purpose is it serving? So in order to be able to understand this concept of power in, um, in what I think is a useful way, we want to present two concepts and I'm going to run through them. Uh, we're going to present lots of concepts today, actually, but the first set of concepts we're going to present is this idea of power with and power over. And we're going to talk about how there are two different ways in which power can work and actually understanding the difference between them is really helpful for understanding how we can be powerful, the, the means by which we can exercise what we would, we would call power with and what's clearly some of you have already identified with and experienced. So let's first look at the question of power over. So when you think of the negative forms of power, you know, the corrupting side of power, you are um, recalling and, and um, imagining power over. Power over is a destructive form of power. It's where, it's where people are out of relationship with each other, where people are exercising dominion over others and over others' interests and not, in, not concerned for the other. It's where power is used as a tool to exclude. Now, it can look like public abuse, right? That's, we can easily pick that out. But, you know, it also can be particularly subtle power over. Like I often tell civil society organisations, it can also look like just a damn bad example of passive aggression, where people just refuse to be publicly and honestly in relationship with ever. It happens all the time. And it doesn't just happen in the world of the baddies. It can happen everywhere. So, you know, we know examples of power over. We know invading Iraq, like we talked about last week, destroying student representation, like I mentioned. When we look at now, it can be examples of, um, you know, poison chalices, like where we require that when people take job guarantees that they forego their industrial relations rights, right? What's happening right now is an example of power over. And when we think of power, we often think of this, the toxicity of it. But there is another kind of power. So this different kind of power, power with, if we could just move the slide, beautiful, yep, perfect. Um, this kind of power is the kind of power that we want to use to guide how we work everywhere. This, is, this was the kind of power, power with, this creative, open, inclusive form of power is what I had felt when I was in the student movement. And not just in the student movement, like for the last 20 years that I've been involved in social change, it's this energy, this um, extraordinary sort of power with others in relationship with others that certainly keeps my fuel going and I'm sure is what fuels many of you if not all of you in in the work that you do you know you can see the list of words supportive honest inspiring problem solving they'd be familiar concepts I want to draw out the word honest because this is not power where we just suck up to each other and have beers and cheers each other like we're best friends, which we might be. It's actually, honesty is also one of the tricky things about power with. It's about holding people to account when they fuck up. It's about saying to each other, having difficult conversations with each other when things aren't working. That, those kinds of attributes are just as important in building a, a power with others. It's not fake. It's not kumbaya. It can include great relationships, but actually there is, a, there is always a tension in this kind of power. It is about power. It is about honestly appraising and interconnecting our interests and being honest when that is not working as well. You know, and I, in terms of finding a place for it, you know, I don't want this, you know, you're going to accuse me of being kumbaya, but like, I kind of feel like this space is a little bit like this, right? We've got, you know, out of nowhere, you know, a couple hundred people over, it's about 600 people over four weeks today, right now, 96 people are online, chewing over and exploring concepts that some of which are familiar, some of which 
are less familiar. It's this honest exploration. People are open to new ideas. We're being creative with how we can we can um, experience organising. Some of you are experienced organisers. Some of you are new to this and you're just wanting to understand a different way of being able to think and be about, um, sort of be in the space of social change. That's that you're actually exercising vulnerability. Part of that is also power. And so I sort of think, you know, if you want an example of of power, with we could just look to this moment and, and sort of recognise that some of what we're doing right here is this. So all this is um, beautifully nice, but I just want to clarify a couple of things. Power over and power with are a continuum. Um, I'm not suggesting all the baddies of the world just use power over and all the goodies of the world are always using power with. That would be beautiful. That's just not true, right? Sometimes good social movements are rich with participation and creativity and sometimes they are top-down machines right and i'm not even here saying that that's evil i'm just simply saying it's an observation about how social movements work and how they trade off sometimes trade off the capacity for power with with each other with the capacity for a victory um power with doesn't just happen and it's it has to be nurtured it's fueled through strong relationships so the practices that we talked about last week an understanding of self-interest, like actually how we are in the world, not just sort of faking connection, but also, as I mentioned, the practice of accountability, the ability to have those tough conversations with each other, being responsible for our power. That's how we ensure that power with is accountable to us and doesn't turn into power over. So it's All right, everyone is back. Welcome back. <clears throat> so I just wanted, so this is just a quick wrap before we move to the second half of the training. Um, one of the, and I've read some of the comments on the slides and I really appreciate people taking notes and scribing and while, um, while also having that conversation. Just, just a small thought, which is in organizing, as in most work and analysis, the public arena, there is this sort of like two dimensions. There's the very intimate small relationships. It's how we actually work with each other. There's a sort of smallness and, um, to what makes successful change. But then there's also a bigness, an enormous, something that's enormous, you know, something that's systemic, conceptual, um, uh, in, in, and often overwhelming, often where we feel less powerful. And I want to invite people to hold those two dimensions in tension, that actually overthinking the smallness and underthinking the bigness actually is not a recipe for us to be powerful. Similarly, overthinking the bigness and then disregarding how we treat each other is also not a recipe to be powerful. We have to think about how we can be powerful in both of those places and spaces. Um, so just to, that's just a thought for us. And I think having Eric now teaching about, um, in a sense, the art, some of the arts of power with is a perfect segue to really break us out to thinking just beyond the relationship, as important as the relationship is, and thinking about those bigger questions. And then more specifically, um, one person actually commented that there's something about power with is the skills of allyship. And I think that that the skills of allyship is stuff that Eric is going to speak about today and also our session next week is going to be about too. It's a key attribute. It's nice to say the words power with, but how do we build it? We need to be able to understand it. So let me hand back to Beth to introduce Eric in our second half. Great. Thanks, Amanda. Um, so in case you missed the start of our session, um, we're very, very lucky to have Eric Peterson with us today. Uh, he is a organizer, campaigner with over 35 years experience. He's worked in union organizing and in electoral organizing, um, helping to run races for different candidates over in the US. He lives um, outside Duluth, Minnesota, in, uh, and he lives on a farm, um, which you'll be able to see in, uh, in his windows, <laughs> through his windows. Um, and he has been, he, has a very deep connection to Australia as well. So he's been working over here for the last 13-ish years, Eric, I believe, um, with many different groups in Australia. Um, and if when he is over here, he often takes a quick trip down to Tasmania to go and visit our forest down there. So Eric, we're really lucky to have you. Thank you so much for your time and I'll hand over to you now. 
Uh, well, thank you. It's, it's, great, uh, it's great to be here. It is nighttime here, so you don't get to see the farm out back. And, uh, but it is, it's lovely. And, and Amanda was the first Australian I ever met in my life. So here we go, full circle, Amanda. Um, so before I want to get started, I want to talk about the three arenas of power. <laughs> but before um, I start, I want to start with some brief framing. So in, in a life um, long ago, uh, last century, I like that, Amanda, last century, uh, at least, uh, in a life long ago in a galaxy far, far away, um, uh, I was an immunologist. I, I was trained as a viral immunologist. Um, and so when I look at this virus, at the COVID, uh, and the devastation that has wrecked, you, you see it at so many levels, so many levels. But as a former immunologist, I also see that it's a virus. It's a novel virus, meaning we don't know a whole lot about it. Uh, but it's still a virus. Um, and by all accounts, at some point, it's going to join all of those other viruses that are out there. At some point, the health crisis is going to be over. Uh, we're not going to be quarantined forever. I'm knocking on wood. So, on the other side of this, then, the question is, is whether we're going to be stronger as a progressive movement. Uh, will the progressive voices and organizations in our community have more influence? Will the policies and practices of our government and the corporations be more compassionate, fairer, more just? Will we be on a clearer path to a sustainable and healthy community or world? Will our frames of reference, the way we look and understand the world, be forever changed, focused on the common good rather than individual gain, on interconnection and interdependence rather than on fear and isolation? Or we, will we drift the other way, towards authoritarianism, towards state control, suspicion, a weakening of personal rights? Um, elevation of corporate, corporate power. All of this is to say there's a whole lot of opportunity and disruption, but there's also a great amount of risk and there's a whole lot at stake. So what I wanna pick up here uh, is what Amanda was talking about and, 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 and dig deeper into power, what it is, uh, how we can test for it. Uh, and I'm gonna use for this uh, what I'm calling three arenas of power how we impact decision makers, how we set the agenda uh, those decision makers act on, and how we frame the story of what's possible and necessary. And in this sense, I'm gonna be referencing, again, what Amanda called collective power, or power with uh, in, uh, in this session. So the next slide, please. In fact, we have to do two slides, sorry. Okay, so, um, Let's start by first looking at a few, few tools of power. Uh, the kind of flip formula that I grew up uh, uh, or matured into the progressive movement with was they have money, but we got people, right? Uh, that sort of, they got money, we got people. So first of all, I don't think that's actually necessarily true. Uh, but more importantly, I actually think the mantra is a false dichotomy. I don't, I don't think that uh, uh, it, uh, uh, it, it works. Uh, Amanda often tells this story, a million people marching in the streets of Sydney was not enough to stop a war. And in my country, millions of people marching and 75% of the population supporting getting rid of assault weapons is not enough to get rid of them. But likewise, we can point to case after case where progressive forces, uh, the power of the people, have toppled much uh, more powerful financed opponents. And this is the essential story of David versus Goliath, right? So the fact is that we need both. And I would like to add another one. So if we would uh, click. I would like to add ideas. Uh, because without ideas, what does winning actually mean? Who benefits? And so we got money, we got people, we got ideas. And if you'd click, I'd like to add one more ingredient to our toolkit, and that's the word organize. 
because the key to any of these money, people, or ideas is being organized. And this is where we're going to start to get into, like, if, this, if these are some of our basic core tools of building power, where then do we need to contest for power? So if we would click. So I want to talk about this in terms of three arenas of power. And if we would click the first arena, the first arena is the power to impact and change decision makers. And this is perhaps the most visible uh, form uh, of, of power or arena of power. This is where decision makers make laws, policy, they determine the corporate practices which impact our families and our communities. So contesting for power uh, in this arena focuses on winning elections or it uh, focuses on advocacy. Again, this can be either at an elected level, uh, say parliament, it could be at a corporate level, like a corporate board, it could be at a regulatory level, uh, like a water board or wh whatever, whatever you call, would call them over there. Um, so this, this is about the folks who actually make the decisions and how do we impact the folks that are making the decisions uh, uh, that impact our communities. Since elected officials, elected decision makers clearly have power to impact our families and communities. One way we contest for power in this first arena is about winning elections. Who makes the decisions mat matters. In my country, it matters if Donald Trump is president or Hillary Clinton. It matters, it probably matters for the whole freaking world. Uh, apologies, by the way. Uh, it, uh, it makes a difference uh, if the Liberal Party is in power or Labor or Greens. Who holds these positions of decision-making power is critically important. So we exert our power, our collective power, in this electoral arena with our votes and all that other sort of stuff that we do during elections to elect one person or another. So another way that we can test for power in this arena is through our advocacy. It, for instance, trying to influence votes in parliament, laws or regulations or policies. And we can exert our power in this arena, again, our collective power, writing letters, holding rallies, standing with signs, calling legislators, boycotting products, trying to get banks to diverse, divest from coal. There are hundreds of ways in which we can uh, contest and exert our power in trying to influence those who are making decisions in this arena. So again, this is probably the most obvious and visible arena of power. Um, and typically, when you hear people, if for those of you who have worked on campaigns, you hear people talk about developing a power map for their campaign, typically this is the arena of power that they're mapping. Who are the targets or the decision makers who can give us what we want? Who do they listen to? How do we leverage that power to secure their vote to win what we need? So contesting power in this arena is important. It's, it's, it's critical. It's necessary. Um, I would argue it's not sufficient. So I suspect that many of you, a number of you, certainly I'll put myself in that category, uh, have worked for or elected somebody to office only to be uh, somewhat uh, disappointed with uh, the uh, outcome in, in terms of what they actually ended up doing in office. Sometimes this is because politicians sell out. Sometimes they didn't have a soul to begin with. Um, I actually think more often it's because they're reacting to another level of power. Who's driving environmental policy right now or water policy in Australia? Is it you? Is it folks like us? Is it actually even elected officials or is it industry groups, mega corporations or shareholders, investors? So we in these, this first arena of power, we may have the power to kill a coal mine or a pipeline. But these are all reactions to somebody else's agenda. The question is, do we have the power to pass a Green New Deal or 100% carbon neutral energy target? 
And this gets us to the second arena of power then. So if we would click. So the second arena of power is the power to set, set the agenda. The, the funny thing about uh, decision makers are <laughs> they decide stuff. Um, and in some ways, uh, especially for elected officials, and this is true for business folks as well, they decide uh, what they decide on actually depends on what's thrust before them. So for wh whoever sets the agenda has enormous influence over what decisions are made. Uh, political leaders, for instance, they can decide on any number of issues. They can debate and decide on a sane refugee policy, or they can go to war. They could do better health care or tax cuts for billionaires. They could support family farmers, or they could support factory farms. So again, when you look at the Australian Parliament, what are the pressing issues that are being debated right now? So right now it's probably COVID, right? Um, and this moment isn't exactly an example of organizing power, of, of, of organizing or building power to push an agenda. Natural disasters also have a way of demanding attention of decision makers. But what we're interested in the second arena is how do we build our own demand for attention? Contesting for power in this arena is about how we can build our base, how we can expand and build our capacity, build, um, in the words of a former mentor of mine, build a constituency that demands change. Build a constituency that demands change, which can make our agenda the agenda the decision makers have to act on. That's power. Um, and it's not like we haven't done this before. Uh, putting aside uh, for a moment the final result of last year's federal election in, in Australia, um, the work of uh, many of you listening here, I know, uh, you were able to make climate action a top election issue. That didn't happen by accident. It wouldn't have been there without building the power to put it there. And there were certainly enough people who didn't want it. Another example come that I want to use is from the United States history, and I have long, long since learned that uh, most Australians know U.S. history better than people in the U.S. know U.S. history, so hopefully this will work. Um, in 1964, in the, civil rights, uh, in the civil rights movement in the United States passed the Civil Rights Act, and the president at that time, Lyndon Johnson, told Martin Luther King that it would be 10 years before there'd be a Voting Rights Act because they had spent all their political capital. But a few months after that conversation, several thousand marchers crossed the Edmund Pettus Bridge. They were attacked. They galvanized the nation. And a few months after that, in 1965, we had a Voting Rights Act. Not because there was an election, not because some Southern Democrats suddenly decided that voting rights was a, was a good idea but because the civil rights movement had made it impossible for the president and Congress not to act. That's power. And that's the power of the second arena. So let's move, if we could, to click to the third. So the, the third arena of power is the power to hold and transform public narratives. This arena of power is often the hardest to identify. Uh, it's uh, perhaps the most hidden. Uh, and that's often because it gets uh, expressed as common sense. It's that, that's just the way things are. But, but the story being told and who gets to tell it has enormous power to frame the debate and, the uh, and, and to frame the problems and shape the decisions. Because the power of the, in this arena, the power of holding public narratives is the power that defines what's necessary what just seems crazy, unrealistic, impossible. So we're going to dig into this one a little bit because this is in some ways the hardest one to grasp. So if we could go to the next uh, slide, please. And um, so I want to start with a quick overview of what we mean by narrative. Um, first, when we talk about public narrative, it's not the same as messaging. 
although the two of them should connect. I want to say that again. Public narrative is not the same as messaging. It's not the same as, as creating a message. Rather, deep narrative work starts with examining core values and beliefs. It's about world. So I want to listen. I've, I've long thought, how do you explain this in a way that is clear? And I came across this clip from Ricardo Levin Morales, a Minneapolis-based social justice artist. And if we could play this clip, um, well, let's listen and then we'll talk about it. Can't hear. Can't hear. You need to share your sound with everyone. That's okay. Let's uh, let's just stop it. Um, Lisa, um, you unmute yourself. No, I would still, right now. <laughs> I was just on mute. Still, give me a second. I'll just start again. Okay. One of the most important insights that cultural organizing has brought to movement struggle is the idea that the soil is more important than the seeds. Um, any, almost anything will grow in rich, nutritious soil, whereas it's hard to get anything to grow if the soil is barren and toxic and won't hold moisture. So the seeds are our projects, our initiatives, our campaigns, our organizations, our, our institutions that we want to build, and the soil is the compost of beliefs, ideas, values, narratives that create the environment within which we're working. So for example, if you're trying to win a decent contract and more funding for school teachers, it's going to be hard if everybody knows that teachers are greedy, lazy, indifferent, and don't care about kids. Right? But the right wing has been hammering in that message, has been instilling that into the soil. In fact, for 40 years, has devoted themselves largely to preparing the soil. And that includes saying stuff that sounds crazy, fighting for things that aren't winnable yet, because they're investing in the future and 10 years later it won't sound crazy and they'll win. So the question is that, that I would pose to you is what stories, what narratives, what beliefs, if they were widely disseminated in the soil of our communities, would make it easy to win? Just imagine for a moment, what would make victories easy if everyone believed it? Because now we're fighting against the weight of all these toxic narratives that people have internalized. So it's really, we're the only ones who can plant the seed of the tree that one day we want to live under. And we need to begin preparing the soil in which that tree can grow. So... I love this metaphor, and Morales describes public narratives as the compost or rich soil. And as a, as a farmer, um, it doesn't actually matter how good your seeds are if you got shitty soil. It doesn't actually matter how good your campaigns are if the soil is toxic. And so if you think of public narrative as compost or the soil that allows our seeds or our campaigns to flourish. For decades, market fundamentalists have made this soil toxic with stories that poison the possibility for a more just, sustainable, connected and loving world. But what Morales poses as a question, which I love is, what then are our stories, our values, our beliefs that if widely held, would make our campaigns more likely to succeed. This is the realm of worldview again. So if we could go to the next slide. So I'd like to introduce a couple of definitions. So if we would click the first definition, it is of worldview. And by worldview, I simply mean the core values, beliefs, assumptions, uh, that shape and interpret the way we see the world. Our, our worldview impacts what we consider to be right, what we consider to be wrong, what's possible, what's necessary, what's not. So let's click the second one. And the second one is public narratives. And public narratives are connected with worldview. Uh, public narratives are the collective or shared stories that we tell about ourselves as a society as a country, as a community, and these express our, our worldview. And these stories already exist. We don't make them up. We elevate them and tap into them. Uh, these, these stories are always in competition, right? 
But these public narratives, they instruct and help decide, define what we think is normal, what we think is common sense. They shape the public consciousness. They, they shape what we can imagine as possible. They, they, they define what's, what's, what's realistic and what's wacky. So some narratives, some of these public narratives are outsized, they're supersized, and they try to drown, drown out or silence or erase other stories. And these stories achieve the status of common sense or that's just how the way things are. And these are called dominant narratives. Oftentimes these aren't even conscious. These narratives are so ingrained, we're not even conscious of them. So again, a, a metaphor, and it comes from uh, Ken Kesey. Ken Kesey wrote the electric Kool-Aid acid test. Don't know if anybody's listened to why, or read that. It's basically a story of early LSD culture in the 1960s in California. Uh, the bus forward. So he describes in, in his book the double yellow line in your brain. Now, translated into Australianese, that's the double white line in your brain. So just imagine for a second two hunks of metal, each weighing a ton, roughly, hurtling down a, a road. Uh, at each other, about 100, 120 kilometers an hour. And all that separates these two hunks of metal is about a meter or a meter and a half and a double white line. There's no cop enforcing that line. There's no gun or prison that's enforcing that line. There's no fence that's defining that line. We've internalized that line or that rule or that boundary as normal, natural, and necessary. We probably don't even think about it. And I would probably advise if you're driving not to think about it, to stay on your side of the line. But this is the same as the power of dominant narratives. So contesting for power in this air arena of public narrative often starts as an excavation project. It's about unmasking and exposing how the current dominant narrative works, the values and worldview that it, hold with, uh, that it holds and privileges, that it elevates. So let's uh, click to the next slide. So we're back to the third arena of power. And the third arena of power uh, is to transform and hold public narratives. So we've seen public narratives are grounded in core values and beliefs. So let's uh, look at a couple of examples. Let's start with a couple of environmental examples. So right now, think of the dominant values frame, the dominant stories, what behaviors, what policies does it support? What, what policies and behaviors and outcomes does it encourage or elevate? So imagine, however, if the dominant public narrative, if those widely held values and beliefs were something else, like our survival depends on protecting human life and all the life around us. What would that mean for the debate around climate and the environment? Or Imagine if the widely held belief was that we needed to be good neighbors and that good neighbors return what they borrow in better shape than when they receive it. I think most people believe that. If that is a widely held value, would these dominant values of stewardship and responsibility make passing a healthier world onto future generations more likely? Seem even like common sense? Or if it were a widely held value and belief that the force were the lungs, the liver and kidneys of our world, which they in fact are, how would this change the way we approach clear felling and deforestation? Or think if it were widely held that, a widely held belief that climate was not weather, but the temperature of a living world. Through this frame of whether a 1.5 degree or even a 2.5 degree rise in temperature feels like a typical day, certainly not alarming, 
even a bit pleasant. But if we think through the frame of a living organism, how well do you think you'd be doing if your temperature went up one and a half degrees? Two and a half degrees, you're in the emergency room. This is how public narrative, how those values, frames, those beliefs and assumptions can completely change what is the debate and, the, and what is possible within the debate. So I'm going to, uh, if we move on, uh, we're going to move into small groups here in, in, in one second, but to build, to build uh, a, a just and a sustainable world, uh, we need to build and contest power in all three arenas. It's not a hierarchy of arenas or a hierarchy of power. All three of them need to be contested in. And so what we're going to move, if, if we can move to the next slide, um, what we're going to move into is we're going to move into groups. And each of you is going to be in a, in a group around one of the arenas. It's a little artificial the way we're breaking up, but given the time, this, this will work. So you'll be in one arena, and there's a set of questions, and these questions will all be on the slides in your small groups. But the first question uh, with the power to impact and change decision makers are, so who currently holds the power to influence decision makers in, in this moment, in this COVID moment? How are they exercising that power to influence? Where do we have opportunities to build and use our power to influence within this arena of the decision makers? So the next slide, please. So the next group will be in the power to set the agenda. And in this, we're looking at interests, whose interests are being served, whose agenda is being furthered. So who benefits and who's harmed by the current decisions? Again, within this COVID moment, whose agenda is being moved? Whose interests are missing or absent or marginalized? And again, where do we find opportunities to move forward a progressive agenda? And in the third slide, please, next slide. And, and then back. And so the, 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 the final group, the third arena, the power to hold and transform narratives, this is looking at what is the dominant story that's being told in the crisis? How does this story, this dominant story, hinder or help our progressive efforts? And again, where do we have opportunities to tell a different story? So let's just get into groups and play around with this. And uh, let's see what you come up with. 